Chapters 10 and 11 of Book 8 of Les Miserables, Volume 3, by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Eastman. Les Miserables, Volume 3, by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book 8. The Wicked Poor Man. Chapter 10. Tariff of Licensed Cabs, Two Francs an Hour. Marius had lost nothing of this scene, and yet in reality he had seen nothing. His eyes had remained fixed on the young girl. His heart had, so to speak, seized her and wholly enveloped her from the moment of her very first step in that garret. During her entire stay there, he had lived that life of ecstasy which suspends material perceptions and precipitates the whole soul on a single point. He had contemplated, not that girl, but that light which wore a satin pelisse and a velvet bonnet. The star Sirius might have entered the room, and he would not have been any more dazzled. While the young girl was engaged in opening the package, unfolding the clothing and the blankets, questioning the sick mother kindly, and the little injured girl tenderly. He watched her every movement, he sought to catch her words. He knew her eyes, her brow, her beauty, her form, her walk. He did not know the sound of her voice. He had once fancied that he had caught a few words at the Luxembourg, but he was not absolutely sure of the fact. He would have given ten years of his life to hear it, in order that he might bear away in his soul a little of that music. But everything was drowned in the lamentable exclamations and trumpet bursts of Jondrette. This added a touch of genuine wrath to Marius's ecstasy. He devoured her with his eyes. He could not believe that it really was that divine creature whom he saw in the midst of those vile creatures in that monstrous lair. It seemed to him that he beheld a hummingbird in the midst of toads. When she took her departure, he had but one thought, to follow her, to cling to her trace, not to quit her until he learned where she lived, not to lose her again at least, after having so miraculously rediscovered her. He leapt down from the commode and seized his hat. As he laid his hand on the lock of the door and was on the point of opening it, a sudden reflection caused him to pause. The corridor was long, the staircase steep. Chandrette was talkative. Monsieur Leblanc had no doubt not yet regained his carriage. If, on turning round in the corridor or on the staircase, he were to catch sight of him, Marius, in that house, he would evidently take the alarm, and find means to escape from him again, and this time it would be final. What was he to do? Should he wait a little? But while he was waiting the carriage might drive off. Marius was perplexed. At last he accepted the risk and quitted his room. There was no one in the corridor. He hastened to the stairs. There was no one on the staircase. He descended in all haste, and reached the boulevard in time to see a fiacre turning the corner of the Rue de Petit Banquier on his way back to Paris. Marius rushed headlong in that direction. On arriving at the angle of the boulevard, he caught sight of the fiacre again, rapidly descending the Rue Mouffetard. The carriage was already a long way off and there was no means of overtaking it. What? Run after it? Impossible. And besides, the people in the carriage would assuredly notice an individual running at full speed in pursuit of a fiacre, and the father would recognize him. At that moment, wonderful and unprecedented good luck, Marius perceived an empty cab passing along the boulevard. There was but one thing to be done to jump into this cab and follow the fiacre. That was sure, efficacious, and free from danger. Marius made the driver a sign to halt, and called to him, By the hour? 
Marius wore no cravat. He had on his working coat, which was destitute of buttons, and his shirt was torn along one of the plates on the bosom. The driver halted, winked, and held out his left hand to Marius, rubbing his forefinger gently with his thumb. "'What is it?' said Marius. "'Pay in advance,' said the coachman. Marius recollected that he had but sixteen sous about him. "'How much?' he demanded. Forty sous. I will pay on my return. The driver's only reply was to whistle the air of La Police and to whip up his horse. Marius stared at the retreating cabriolet with a bewildered air. For the lack of four and twenty sous, he was losing his joy, his happiness, his love. He had seen, and he was becoming blind again. He reflected bitterly, and it must be confessed with profound regret, on the five francs which he had bestowed that very morning on that miserable girl. If he had had those five francs, he would have been saved. He would have been born again. He would have emerged from the limbo and darkness. He would have made his escape from isolation and spleen from his widowed state. He might have re-knotted the black thread of his destiny to that beautiful golden thread, which had just floated before his eyes and had broken at the same instant once more. He returned to his hovel in despair. He might have told himself that Monsieur Leblanc had promised to return in the evening, and that all he had to do was to set about the matter more skillfully, so that he might follow him on that occasion. But in his contemplation it is doubtful whether he had heard this. As he was on the point of mounting the staircase, he perceived on the other side of the boulevard, near the deserted wall skirting the rue de la Barrière de Gobelin, Chandrette, wrapped in the philanthropist's greatcoat, engaged in conversation with one of those men of disquieting aspect, who have been dubbed by common consent prowlers of the barriers. People of equivocal face, of suspicious monologues, who present the air of having evil minds, and who generally sleep in the daytime, which suggests the supposition that they work by night. These two men, standing there motionless and in conversation, in the snow which was falling in whirlwinds, formed a group that a policeman would surely have observed, but which Marius hardly noticed. Still, in spite of his mournful preoccupation, he could not refrain from saying to himself that this prowler of the barriers with whom Chandrette was talking, resembled a certain Pancho, alias Prontanier, alias Bigrenaille, whom Corferac had once pointed out to him as a very dangerous nocturnal roamer. This man's name the reader has learned in the preceding book. This Pancho, alias Prontanier, alias Bigrenaille, figured later on in many criminal trials, and became a notorious rascal. He was at that time only a famous rascal. Today he exists in the state of tradition among ruffians and assassins. He was at the head of a school towards the end of the last reign. And in the evening, at nightfall, at the hour when groups form and talk in whispers, he was discussed at La Force in the Fosse aux Lyon. One might even, in that prison, precisely at the spot, where the sewer which served the unprecedented escape in broad daylight of thirty prisoners in 1843 passes under the culvert, read his name, Poncho, audaciously carved by his own hand on the wall of the sewer during one of his attempts at flight. In 1832 the police already had their eye on him, but he had not as yet made a serious beginning. Chapter 11 Offers of Service from Misery to Wretchedness Marius ascended the stairs of the hovel with slow steps. At the moment when he was about to re-enter his cell, he caught sight of the elder Chandrette girl following him through the corridor. The very sight of this girl was odious to him. It was she who had his five francs. It was too late to demand them back. The cab was no longer there, the fiacre was far away. Moreover, 
she would not have given them back. As for questioning her about the residence of the persons who had just been there, that was useless. It was evident that she did not know, since the letter signed Fabanteau had been addressed to the benevolent gentleman of the church of saint jacques du Opa. Marius entered his room and pushed the door to after him. It did not close. He turned round and beheld a hand which held the door half open. What is it? he asked. Who is there? It was the Jondrette girl. Is it you? resumed Marius almost harshly. Still you! What do you want with me? She appeared to be thoughtful and did not look at him. She no longer had the air of assurance which had characterized her that morning. She did not enter, but held back in the darkness of the corridor, where Marius could see her through the half-open door. "'Come now, will you answer?' cried Marius. "'What do you want with me?' She raised her dull eyes, in which a sort of gleam seemed to flicker vaguely, and said, "'Monsieur Marius, you look sad. What is the matter with you?' "'With me?' said Marius. "'Yes, you.' "'There is nothing the matter with me.' "'Yes, there is.' "'No.' "'I tell you there is.' "'Let me alone.' Marius gave the door another push, but she retained her hold on it. "'Stop,' said she. "'You are in the wrong. Although you are not rich, you were kind this morning. Be so again now. You gave me something to eat.' Now tell me what ails you. You are grieved, that is plain. I do not want you to be grieved. What can be done for it? Can I be of any service? Employ me. I do not ask for your secrets. You need not tell them to me. But I may be of use nevertheless. I may be able to help you, since I help my father. When it is necessary to carry letters, to go to houses, to inquire from door to door, to find out an address, to follow anyone, I am of service. Well, you may assuredly tell me what is the matter with you, and I will go and speak to the persons. Sometimes it is enough if someone speaks to the persons. That suffices to let them understand matters, and everything comes right. Make use of me. An idea flashed across Marius's mind. What branch does one disdain when one feels that one is falling? He drew near to the Jondrette girl. Listen he said to her. She interrupted him with a gleam of joy in her eyes. Oh, yes, do call me thou. I like that better. Well, he resumed, thou hast brought hither that old gentleman and his daughter. Yes. Dost thou know their address? No. Find it for me. The Jondrette's dull eyes had grown joyous, and they now became gloomy. Is that what you want? she demanded. Yes. Do you know them? No. That is to say, she resumed quickly, you do not know her, but you wish to know her. This them, which had turned into her, had something indescribably significant and bitter about it. Well, can you do it? said Marius. You shall have the beautiful lady's address. There was still a shade in the words, the beautiful lady, which troubled Marius. He resumed. Never mind. After all, the address of the father and daughter. Their address, indeed. She gazed fixedly at him. What will you give me? Anything you like. Anything I like? Yes. You shall have the address. She dropped her head. Then, with a brusque movement, she pulled to the door, which closed behind her. Marius found himself alone. He dropped into a chair, with his head and both elbows on his bed, absorbed in thoughts which he could not grasp, and as though a prey to vertigo. All that had taken place since the morning, the appearance of the angel, her disappearance, what that creature had just said to him, a gleam of hope floating in an immense despair. This was what filled his brain confusedly. All at once he was violently aroused from his reverie. 
He heard the shrill, hard voice of Jondrette utter these words, which were fraught with a strange interest for him. I tell you I am sure of it, and that I recognized him. Of whom was Jondrette speaking? Whom had he recognized? Mr. Leblanc? The father of his Rasoul? What, did Jondrette know him? Was Marius about to obtain, in this abrupt and unexpected fashion, all the information without which his life was so dark to him? Was he about to learn at last who it was that he loved, who that young girl was, who her father was? Was the dense shadow which enwrapped them on the point of being dispelled? Was the veil about to be rent? Ah, heavens! He bounded rather than climbed upon his commode and resumed his post near the little peephole in the partition wall. Again he beheld the interior of Jondrette's hovel. End of Book 8, Chapter 11